Okay, Dan, are you ready to go? I'm ready to go, Dwayne. Excellent, thank you. So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to get started and I want to thank Dr. Lucy for his willingness to present to us today. And uh, I want to thank all of you for, for tuning in. I'm very excited um, to host this webinar for you all. Um, because we're using a webinar format, I'm going to start with just a few of the ground rules so that this can go off as seamlessly as possible. So um, bear with me for just a few, few minutes. Uh, so here goes. So first of all, make sure that your, um, your microphone is on mute. That's important. I believe that can be done centrally here, but I would like for you, each of you to make sure your microphone is on mute. Um, we will have the opportunity for ask, uh, answering questions following Dr. Lucy's presentation. So there were many questions submitted in advance, and I am gonna be responsible for asking those questions. We also have the opportunity to, for you to ask questions from the webinar using the Q&A tool, which is at the bottom of the screen. That's active, so if you have questions during the talk, you can post them there, and we'll come back to those, but we will come back to those at the end of the talk. So. Um, feel free to add, the, add those questions, but we won't be able to answer them in real time in the middle of the, of the presentation. So with those ground rules out of the way, uh, thank you all for joining me. I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to be here and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Lucy to present COVID-19 insights from an epidemic, ep epidemics responder. So Dr. Lucy was an undergraduate student and a medical student at Dartmouth. He trained in San Francisco during the height of the AIDS epidemic and received specialty training in infectious disease at Harvard. He's been on a frontline responder in virtually every infectious disease and in epidemic and pandemic across the world for nearly 30 years. I think one of the most important achievements is the way in which he has drawn public attention to the issue of epidemics and pandemics through his efforts to develop at the Smithsonian Insti National Museum of Natural History, an entire program on infectious disease and the way they happen and the way they turn into pandemics across the globe. So it is a real treat to have one of our alumni here to talk about the current COVID-19 pandemic. And I wanna thank you so much for joining us today, Dan, and please take it away when you are ready. Great, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, uh, Dean uh, Compton. And uh, thank you to everyone who's online. It looks like the number's uh, over 1,200 right now. So it's a great honor uh, as a Dartmouth alum to be able to share some of my um, opinions uh, on this pandemic. Um, and uh, as the Dean said, uh, we'll certainly take as many questions as, as we're able to. Uh, and then I think this uh, presentation is being uh, recorded. And I hope that this is the first of a, of a series um, as this pandemic uh, goes on um, with many other um, experts uh, from Dartmouth, um, hopefully participating in the, in the future. So um, this is a day 100 since I first heard about the epidemic uh, or when it was really just a possible outbreak uh, on December, the night of December 30th, uh, 2019. Um, and here we are today on, on April 7th. Uh, just briefly, as uh, uh, Dean Compton mentioned, I was very fortunate to, uh, after medical school graduation, to uh, be able to start my internship at the University of California, San Francisco, and then uh, at the beginning in 1982 of the recognition of the AIDS epidemic. The virus had not yet been discovered, but the virus had discovered us. So there are many, many patients that we saw uh, in San Francisco as well as in other cities um, across the country. It made a huge impression on me because uh, we didn't know the cause, we didn't know how it was spread. Um, and we felt that you know, as the uh, medical workers, as interns drawing blood and putting in intravenous lines and and spinal taps, et cetera, that we might be exposed and infected ourselves. Um, uh, fortunately, um, almost none of us were. Um, but HIV at 82 in San Francisco uh, was why I went into infectious disease. Otherwise, I was going to go into neurology and uh, sleep research. Um, uh, one thing that I always remember about uh, 1982 in San Francisco uh, was that our teachers couldn't teach us about the disease. So very distinguished uh, teachers at UCSF uh, about everything except for this brand new disease in, in which San Francisco was one of the major epicenters. So for 20 years, I worked in the field of HIV in, in San Francisco and, and, and Boston at the National Institutes of Health as a attending physician at Building 10, the clinical center um, uh, 
in the same uh, institute, uh, NIAD, as uh, Dr. Tony Fauci. Uh, and then I've worked in DC and taught at Georgetown. And as the Dean mentioned, fortunate was very fortunate to be able to propose an, an exhibit on epidemics in 2014 to the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, which finally opened in 2018 and will remain open probably till uh, 2022. Um, so 2003, um, everything changed for me career-wise, and I started going overseas to epidemics, um, often multiple times each year to multiple places uh, to get a better appreciation and understanding of the um, epidemic in different locations, uh, and then coming back and teaching about it and helping the, uh, the U.S., particularly the D.C. area, prepare better uh, for the epidemic if it came here. Um, so I, I list those uh, epidemics and places. I won't go through them. Um, but you can see them there and they'll be on the, on the slide from now on. The um, biggest uh, impact for me after 1982 in San Francisco and AIDS was 2014 in Ebola. I was very fortunate to be able to go to Sierra Leone and then to Liberia, Liberia with Doctors Without Borders, uh, thanks to a Dartmouth uh, College of Medical School alum, John Lawrence, um, and, and was able to take care of uh, maybe 250 patients, hands-on, gloves-on care uh, patients with, with Ebola. It made a very strong impression on me about the importance of not only be a, being a clinician, taking care of individual patients, but of trying to, um, how should I say this, uh, uh, to impact, to change, to modify, to improve uh, policy, uh, whether it's in DC or, or Geneva at the World Health Organization or, or anywhere else. Because what happens in places like DC and Geneva and London and Paris and Beijing and many other places has a direct impact, so to speak, on the ground with epidemics in terms of who lives and who dies. Um, so again, I was able to go to several places in Zika, yellow fever, chikungunya, Brazil, DR Congo, Karachi, uh, Islamabad, and then uh, uh, Madagascar for the plague pneumonia. Um, and, then, and then this began. So I first heard about it on December 30th, 2019, and immediately it reminded me of SARS and of MERS, the two previous coronavirus pneumonias. Um, but this one, of course, is the first one that has spread around the world and has done so much damage to, to human beings, so much suffering and death and so much economic damage. And, and unfortunately, it's, it's nowhere near being finished yet. So looking ahead, the next 10 years, uh, my students always ask me at Georgetown, what's next? And what I say is what's next is already here. We just haven't recognized it yet. Another thing that I like to emphasize is past is prologue. So for example, in these two pictures in Toronto, I was very fortunate in 2003 to go work at uh, SARS Hospital, Scarborough General Hospital. And um, on weekends, I uh, w had to work in the intensive care unit. And uh, what you see on the screen there is the personal protective equipment or PPE that, that uh, I was taught to wear. And I always worked with another person who helped me to put it on properly and to safely take it off. So then fast forward 11 years, Monrovia, Liberia, Doctors Without Borders, they always have the yellow personal protective equipment for Ebola. And uh, I, was, I was very familiar with the personal protective equipment because it was so similar to what I'd worn in, in Toronto during SARS. And, and subsequently then, uh, as I mentioned, another respiratory spread disease, this is a bacteria, a plague, Yersinia pestis, was able to work in Madagascar and, and Tananarivo, the capital in 2017, with, um, with World Health Organization. Um, and of course now this is, this is, this pandemic is the worst that I've ever seen in my, in my life. Um, why is it different than AIDS primarily? Because this is spread through the air and of course HIV is not. So I was asked to just mention a few lessons and I'll just go th through them quickly. Um, I'm sure they'll be self-evident to, to most people are my age, our age. Um, so I'd say that for me, the one best lesson that sums up the whole career of 40 years is uh, three verbs and they are anticipate, recognize, and act. And I capitalize and underline act because that's the most important of the three. Um, in DC, people talk a lot about lessons learned. But for me, there are no lessons learned, except those proven by actions taken. So again, the third verb, act, is the most important one. Uh, usually when I go overseas to outbreaks, I like to go in the, the beginning as soon as I can possibly get there, um, which is a bad idea financially, but it's a very uh, rewarding uh, personally and professionally to be able to work with international colleagues who may speak a different language, different religion, different culture, different uh, skin color, um, but you have this common effort working together um, to try to help uh, people survive and recover. Um, and you have the common enemy, which is the pathogen, the virus, or the bacteria. So there's a phrase that 
uh, is often used and sometimes attributed to as an African proverb or a, a Chinese proverb, but I think it's just a human, human species proverb. And it is go fast, go alone, go far, go together. For me, this is a sequence. It's not a dichotomy. So what I aim to do is to try to create a synergy of strengths uh, with colleagues, with friends, with strangers, with international um, uh, epidemic fighters, if you will. And again, what's next is already here. We just haven't recognized it yet. And we need to look better, identify sooner, recognize sooner, recognize what needs to be done, and then most importantly, take the action that needs to be done to, to stop, to prevent, to mitigate, to slow down, to decrease the level of suffering in the world. So what about applying lessons learned? Well, I was, again, very fortunate to be able to work in June of 2003 in Toronto Scarborough General when SARS was still going on, uh, given a lot of responsibility there. <laughs> In case of be careful what you wish for because you might get it. Um, but one thing I, I learned out of many lessons from the Toronto experience was the importance of an N95 respirator, which now everyone knows about. It's what protects the best uh, against uh, viruses uh, or, or bacteria like tuberculosis. And so when I came back um, from, from uh, Toronto, and also I've been in Hong Kong, um, I um, uh, talked to the leadership of our hospital, uh, where I was working in Washington Hospital Center, the largest hospital in DC, 907 beds, and suggested uh, um, politely, but, 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 but encouraged strongly that um, all of the 5,200 uh, healthcare workers, full-time and part-time, should be trained on how to properly um, put on and, and, and take off an N95 respirator. And so uh, it was really through the work of all the other co-authors that you see there, Ella Day, Mark Smith, Craig Peet, and others, Chris Worker, Karen Meyerson, uh, who, who did this starting uh, in November of 2003 and finishing six months later on May 1st of 2004. I'm not sure of any other hospitals in the country that, that did this um, after SARS uh, or, or any time before today. Uh, and then also I want to mention, I very briefly was able to work at the DC Department of Health as the Chief Health Officer, also in the first half of 2004. And I was very fortunate to be able to um, uh, get along well with the deputy mayor who had uh, funds, U.S. funds, uh, for bio-preparedness, if you will. So I proposed that the D.C. Department of Health purchase 500,000 N95 respirators and 2 million surgical masks. Everyone was against that idea except for the deputy mayor who controlled the money, and she thought it was a great idea. So we were able to make the purchase. People were very unhappy with me for about five years, and then when pandemic H1N1 came, April 25th of 2009, I got a whole bunch of phone calls because I was no longer at the Department of Health. Like, what did you do with those masks, the N95s and the masks? So they were used uh, from day one uh, for the pandemic of H1N1. So as Dr. Sorry, Dr. Professor, <laughs> Professor and Dean uh, Compton mentioned, um, for me, it was really a career dream uh, when the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History uh, agreed um, after some amount of fundraising and a real synergy of strength with many, many people from the museum and across the country and around the world to work together to create this exhibit on epidemics, which has about uh, 10 epidemics um, uh, presented visually and, um, uh, and in text form, uh, written form. Uh, the unifying theme of this exhibit is what's called One Health, which is really a triad of human health, animal health, and environmental health. Most of the epidemics that we know of, including this one, in my opinion, uh, come from animals initially, and then the virus jumps species to our human species, and then often it spreads to varying degrees from person to person um, uh, through various ways, either through the air, through body fluids, blood, sexual uh, secretions, or other ways. So that's the focus of, of the exhibit, but also we have a part that's called uh, on the upside. In other words, what can you as an individual visiting the exhibit or watching about it online or downloading the do-it-yourself, the DIY version, uh, which has gone to over 40 countries and been shown in over 150 places since 2018, translated into five languages. Uh, what can you as an individual do to um, prepare better and, and respond better to uh, epidemics? And again, I just want to mention the synergy of strengths uh, that, I, that I listed as one of the main lessons of my career. Um, very fortunate the museum allowed me to invite uh, 30 colleagues who I've worked with in other countries over all these years and from the United States who I'd worked with 
uh, and, and they are featured in the exhibit itself with uh, a picture, their picture and a 99 word or less uh, personal perspective. So to move on to coronavirus pneumonia. So there's been three and this is the first one in 2002, 2003, the SARS, which stands for severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus causing a pneumonia. It's thought to have started in Southeast China in Guangdong province, which is different than where this pandemic started in a different province called Hubei province uh, that we'll get to in a second. Um, so one thing I've always wanted to do is uh, work with patients overseas, work with international colleagues, but also to uh, understand how the outbreak started. Where did it start? When did it start? Um, in, in order to try to prevent other ones or similar ones, um, or to understand better what needs to be done from the origin uh, where the animal spillover occurred, we call it, the spillover of the virus from animals to humans. We need to control the, understand and control the animal source as well as the person to person human spread in order to stop an epidemic or to prevent an outbreak from becoming an epidemic. And unlike this case, try to prevent an epidemic from becoming a pandemic, which it already is and became so very, very quickly. Um, so I won't go into detail, but, but the person in the picture, the doctor and who's standing to my left shoulder uh, worked here in, in Guangzhou at Sun, at Sun University. And he was sent out in uh, first week of December to try to understand this new pneumonia, which in the end, it's been decided that it only started November 16th. For me, that's not plausible. It had to have started sooner in order to have so many uh, people with a new pneumonia that the infectious hospital would send out one of their young doctors uh, uh, to investigate. Uh, does it matter? Maybe not, especially now. Um, but for me, it established a pattern of trying to um, understand where outbreaks really started and when they really started. So the second coronavirus pneumonia was this one. It's called MERS or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, most people think it started in Saudi Arabia um, in, 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 uh, in June of 2012. But in fact, the first outbreak in humans was retrospectively proven to occur in Jordan. In fact, in northern Jordan, Zarqa, north of Amman, near the Syrian border, in a government hospital in an intensive care unit. The head nurse died very tragically um, while taking care of patients. One of the patients died, but they didn't know what the cause was, but they were able, um, they meaning uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed al Abdelat, uh, who's head of epidemiology at the Jordanian Ministry of Health and a friend, someone I respect greatly, he stopped the epidemic without knowing the cause. And also he saved the lung fluid from the nurse who died and the blood sample from the young 25 year old man who died and subsequently was able to go back when the test for MERS coronavirus became available and test and prove that it was that MERS virus that caused the first known outbreak in humans in Jordan, not Saudi Arabia. So now coming to this uh, coronavirus pneumonia, which is the third coronavirus pneumonia. And I emphasize that because there are at least four other coronaviruses in humans that don't cause pneumonia. In other words, a lower uh, respiratory tract infection in the lungs. They cause an upper respiratory infection, a cold in the nose and the, in the throat. So we're focus, focusing on the three that cause the most um, suffering and, and death, morbidity and mortality in humans because they cause a pneumonia, lower respiratory tract infection. So this is the map of China. And as you can see, the sort of a, um, pale orange or peach color is the province of Hubei, H-U-B-E-I. Uh, and Wuhan in white is the, um, is the capital. It has 19 million people in the metropolitan area, 11 million in Wuhan central. It's thought to be the place where the virus, which has been named now SARS coronavirus 2, causing the disease called COVID-19, 19 means because it started in 2019. Um, it's thought to have started in, a, in an animal market in Wuhan, uh, near one of the three main train stations. Now, it turns out that this animal market is called a seafood market, but it's a very large market where they sell seafood, but also a lot of live animals. Wuhan, in my view, very importantly, it's located here in, in uh, sort of the south central part of China, and it is the center for high speed trains to all of China. So in a matter of hours, you can go north to Beijing, all the way to Harbin. Uh, you can go east to Shanghai um, or Hangzhou. You can go west to Chengdu and you can go south to Guangzhou and Hong Kong and, and everywhere else. So imagine if you're the virus, you'd be quite happy to be uh, emerging from it, some still unnamed, unrecognized, unreported animal 
into humans who then get on trains and travel throughout China. In addition, Wuhan has a large international airport and the 20 largest international destinations from Wuhan uh, include 17 countries in Asia, Bangkok being number one, uh, two in Australia, and one in uh, United Arab Emirates. So from a travel point of view in our modern 2020 world, um, I think the virus um, picked a very good way to um, explode really and, and infect many people, not only in China, but around the world. So I'm gonna go briefly uh, chronologically. Um, and so Dr. Li uh, Wenjiang, an ophthalmologist, 34 years old. In December, he was one of eight people, um, uh, mostly health care workers, who sent out warnings on the Chinese equivalent of Twitter, I believe, Weibo accounts, warning of a new contagious SARS-like pneumonia in December, in the second half of December. Um, he was, um, he and I think the other seven uh, people as well, were brought in uh, and questioned by the police and punished. They had to sign some form of confession and then sent back to work. Back to work in Wuhan uh, in December and January met primarily taking care of patients with COVID-19. Um, and he got infected as did many, many other, uh, probably over 3,000 other healthcare workers, Chinese healthcare workers. Um, and although he was 34 years old, he died February the 6th, leaving behind his pregnant wife and their five-year-old child and his two elderly uh, parents. Um, he was 34. There have been other Chinese doctors documented um, who died at ages 27, 29, 33, 39, 40, uh, 49, 50. Um, so for me, this was a big alarm uh, when I first saw it on December 30th, the news about an outbreak, even though China said up until January 20th, China said this is not contagious from person to person. And initially they said no healthcare workers infected until January 20th, they finally said, okay, there's 14 healthcare workers infected, one, four. And it is transmitted person to person, but they knew that. And I'll say why that's, that's the fact. Uh, I'll say that shortly. So I began writing some uh, updates, if you will, uh, about the uh, outbreak uh, on January 6th in the Infectious Disease Society of America, where I'm the Global Health Committee. Uh, at first they said, well, um, are you sure this is gonna be a big deal? Cause we, you know, we, 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 we don't, uh, have a um, you know, web page necessarily where we can put this. Um, uh, but then by the next day they said, yes, okay, uh, you can put it on the Science Speaks uh, blog uh, website on the Infectious Disease Society of America. So uh, back then the virus wasn't known, it wasn't, hasn't given a name, it was just called a pneumonia of unknown cause. Um, but I was very impressed by what, 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 sorry, what colleagues in Hong Kong were doing because I stayed in touch with uh, colleagues in Hong Kong since 2003 when I went over there and I've gone back almost every year. They invite me back to come talk about Ebola working in the field or MERS working in the field in the Middle East, uh, Zika going to Brazil, uh, plague going to Madagascar. Uh, so I've gone there once or twice a year, uh, every year since 2003. And they were very concerned from the very first moment. So our December 30th was China's December 31st. So that same day, they um, posted up alerts, sent out letters to physicians um, about this new outbreak. Um, and uh, for me, it, this is very concerning, um, uh, and, 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 and unfortunately, it's become what everyone feared the most. Uh, January 14th, I was very lucky to have uh, already had an invitation since early November to come to the United Nations um, in New York City um, on the fifth floor. There were two doctors who worked there full time, uh, Dr. Fola from Nigeria, you can see in this picture, and then Dr. Esther Khan in the next picture. And they asked me to give a talk about anything I wanted. They said, maybe you want to talk about Ebola because you're always talking about Ebola, you know, everywhere. So I, I said, no, I, I would like to talk about um, this. So what, I sent the email and then it was sent out to over 215 people uh, around the world, UN email addresses on December 23rd. So before uh, we knew about the outbreak uh, in Wuhan. Uh, and so the title was basically Lessons from SARS for the Next Rapidly Spreading Respiratory Pandemic. And this is the email from the UN from a person named Alessandra um, that, that went out on December 23rd. Um, Dr. Tan here standing on my right shoulder, she's uh, the head of the, um, the physician unit on the fifth floor at the UN uh, and Dr. Fola. Uh, and, and they allowed me to bring some posters, the do it yourself version of the Smithsonian exhibit uh, and to show uh, over the course of two weeks, uh, not at the entrance to the UN, uh, but in several uh, long hallways and near the cafeteria. So a lot of people were able to see the Smithsonian uh, exhibit. Um, 
So moving along a little bit more than uh, the sixth update I posted on the, on the, on the Infectious Society of America webpage about this outbreak. Um, now we knew it was a coronavirus. Um, uh, basically, I questioned uh, the story, the dogma really, that this virus came out of the seafood market and live animal market in December. Um, I didn't think that was plausible. Uh, and then I stated why. And then a, um, a investigative journalist for uh, this well-known uh, science journal called Science, uh, John Cohen, he, um, he called me up at home on Sunday morning, the 26th, and sort of interrogated me, which is, which is fine, uh, uh, which is what I wanted, like punch holes in my, my hypothesis uh, that the virus started somewhere other than this market and prior to December. Um, so he ended up writing a story and, and posting it on Science uh, website that night, the night of Sunday, January the 26th, which he didn't tell me he was going to do that, but I should have known. But the next morning I woke up and I had dozens, dozens of emails from around the world and um, uh, asking, you know, for interviews and comments. And a few said, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, et cetera, et cetera. But, but that was a very small percentage. So I was, I was happy. Uh, <clears throat> moving on chronologically then, uh, 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 February 6th with the medical student at Georgetown, Kristen uh, Kent. Uh, we published this online article that summarized our um, understanding of the epidemic at that point. It was unknown source, unrecognized spread, and pandemic potential. It wasn't declared a pandemic by World Health Organization until March the 11th, uh, when already approximately, well, well over 100 countries had reported cases. And one thing we emphasize that I just want to uh, mention here, because it's increasingly important, uh, is uh, there should be um, global emphasis and prioritization on the outbreak in the Southern Hemisphere um, and, and, and Africa, the entire continent, not just the Southern Hemisphere part of, of Africa. Um, part of why I say that is because it's going to be the winter in the Southern Hemisphere, South America, parts of Africa, Indonesia, uh, Australia, starting in June. And in my view, there's going to be a, a rapid increase in the number of cases um, in the you know, Southern Hemisphere's uh, winter, while it's probably going to go down but not go away in the Northern Hemisphere summer, June, July, and August. So finally, I was able to go to Hong Kong and to the mainland, um, which I wanted to do, but didn't quite have enough funds, et cetera, um, in, 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 in January. So I was finally able to go February 11th for 22 days to Hong Kong, to the mainland, and then to Cairo to try to understand what was going on in, in the Middle East and in Iran and Egypt and elsewhere. So this picture is from Hong Kong. We're having dinner together. Three physicians, Hong Kong physicians, I have immense respect for. They took care of patients with SARS in 2003, and they um, are taking care of patients now with SARS coronavirus 2 or COVID-19. I really wanted, I went to the mainland because I wanted to go to Wuhan to work side by side with uh, my Chinese colleagues, uh, doctors, nurses, uh, respiratory therapists, et cetera, um, healthcare workers of all types. Um, but it wasn't possible to go there, so I thought directly from Hong Kong, so I thought I would go to Beijing and get permission from someone very high up, a government official. It wasn't possible to go to Beijing without being in uh, quarantine for 14 days, so I went to Shanghai, where I didn't have to be in quarantine, although I would have been later. Um, and I talked with a number of people there, um, uh, but was not able to get uh, permission to go work in uh, Wuhan. Um, so then I went on to, uh, to Cairo. Um, I did learn a lot of good information, though, about how these doctors and others in Hong Kong were taking care of patients and how they're taking care of patients in the mainland, mostly in Wuhan, but some several hundred in Shanghai and Beijing as well. And uh, gave a long interview, uh, uh, many thousands of words uh, in Mandarin, uh, uh, which <clears throat> um, I would uh, leave up to your discussion if you wanted to search that out. Um, while I was in Hong Kong, I wrote this update um, for the Infectious Society of America. And for me, it's, uh, there's basically, there's before February 14th and there's after February 14th. Um, because on February 14th, China admitted for the first time that over 1,716 health workers had been infected with this virus. Remember, it was only on January 20th that they admitted that, that there was any person to person spread and that there were only 14 healthcare workers from one hospital from one neurosurgical ward in one hospital in Wuhan, a city of 11 million to 19 million people. It wasn't that plausible then, and it turns out that it wasn't true. Um, so February 14th, China says 1,716 healthcare workers were lab confirmed to have the virus, but as many as 3,019 might actually be infected. So, 
So this was a day I'll always remember. And so what I wrote in the blog that this is a day that will always be remembered by healthcare workers around the world as well as, as well as epidemic planners and responders, as well as historians of this worsening pan epidemic is the word I like, something between an epidemic and a pandemic, pan epidemic. And then the second of two pages, I wrote that the implications for China and other nations around the world preparing for and responding to this growing pan epidemic, uh, SARS coronavirus 2, are, are staggering. And then I list eight things. I won't go through them all, but I obviously have emphasized uh, one or two that there would be shortages of the personal protective equipment, just like there were in China, uh, and that there was an acute need for mass production of personal protective equipment, really around the world, including in our, in our country, that there would be other. Um, issues for healthcare workers in terms of infecting family members, um, ethical issues, crisis standards of care we need immediate planning for, which has finally happened here um, in America. And that really this pandemic rep represented or pan epidemic, all of society uh, concerns and considerations, including economic and political factors. Um, I sent that to most people that I know directly uh, in many cities across the United States uh, and posted it up here. More than a thousand people have viewed it. Um, I'm not sure it really had any impact, but there it is. So to, to end here on a couple last slides on what are called reasons for hope. Um, and this is something a college classmate from 77, Dr. Vince Lepore, who's a surgeon out in California, encouraged me to do. do. He said, Dan, you know, you, you really should include some, some reasons for hope if you can find any. Uh, but there are some, and so I'm going to list a couple here on the slides. So first one is I think that there's um, rational, uh, reasonable, uh, real time, uh, this month, April into May, reason to hope that there'll be treatment for the virus and a treatment to decrease what I would call the inflammation storm. Medical people call it a cytokine storm, just meaning a cytokines are chemicals that the body releases as part of the immune response to try to, um, to win the battle against uh, viruses and other infections. So in terms of drugs and antibodies, um, there are drugs that um, might, but we don't know yet for sure, but that might prevent or prophylax uh, getting the infection. So prevent the infection from ever occurring, then there are drugs that might be shown to be safe and effective to treat people who do have the infection, including those that are very sick in an ICU or on ventilators. Um, and some examples are a drug called remdesivir. And I'm not, um, I don't have any stock, actually any stock at all in anything or bonds. Uh, so I, I'm not pushing any of these drugs. I'm not advocating for them. I'm just uh, pick, uh, picking one or two of them out. This one, remdesivir. And the reason is that China started a randomized controlled trial, which is the gold standard for understanding and proving whether a, a drug or any kind of treatment actually works. They started early. So the, the results are going to be announced this month by China. I don't know what the results are. Um, um, the results are released by the end of this month. It's possible they'll be released next week, um, but but this month, April. It's a drug that um, uh, works in the test tube like a lot of things, but that doesn't really mean much of anything to me. Uh, uh, you have to show that it works in people in a randomized controlled trial. Uh, and that's what was done with remdesivir. And in fact, there's probably two such trials coming out of China. There's also several trials of this drug going on in the United States now. Uh, I believe Dartmouth is uh, included in one of those trials, Dartmouth Hitchcock. Medical Center. Um, uh, and Nebraska is a big uh, study site also, Omaha. So that's very important news. It's given only intravenously though, so there's no oral form. Um, uh, then there are a bunch of other oral drugs, um, and I'm not going to go into any of those, but uh, these are two that you've seen, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, you've heard about. Uh, I'm not really going to say much more about those, uh, except that uh, neither one has ever been approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for any virus. Okay, hydroxychloroquine is for a parasite, malaria, and an autoimmune rheumatologic disease called lupus. And azithromycin, as you know, ZPAC, it's uh, only for bacteria. It's an antibiotic, so it's only for bacteria. So antibodies, again, there's a, there's a possibility that there will be one or more um, antibodies against the virus that could prevent infection from occurring and also treat people who have the infection and large amounts of virus, what we sometimes call viral load. So when you have a lot of virus that's replicating, um, it, 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 you can get a very large amount of virus uh, in your body. And, and, and we have that same approach, virus load with other diseases like HIV, viral load, like hepatitis C viral load. Um, so what are the possible sources of the antibodies? Well, one is, as you know from the news, um, and about a week or more ago, the FDA uh, approved for compassionate use this idea of taking the blood with the plasma from the blood that has antibodies 
from people who have survived and recovered from COVID-19 and then, and then infusing it or transfusing it into the blood of people who are very sick in intensive care unit or, or, and or on a ventilator in the intensive care unit. Um, it takes longer scientifically, but I think it's a very promising uh, avenue of investigation to develop antibodies, um, not from the plasma, but from the, the cells that make antibodies. They're called B cells or plasma cells. And, and they're made into, they, they make what's called monoclonal antibodies, meaning that they focus, um, they're monoclonal, so they're antibodies only against the virus. Whereas the plasma from people who have survived can have antibodies against the virus, but antibodies against other, other things as well. Um, so really it's hopeful that we're gonna hear promising news and possibly even news that, that one drug uh, uh, later this month may have some efficacy. I don't think it's gonna be a, a wonder drug, um, but I hope it is. But I'm hoping that at least it works uh, for patients who are the sickest, who are intensive care, whether they're on a ventilator or not. So I'm hoping that's what we're gonna hear about uh, remdesivir later this month, possibly in a week or two. Um, also reason for hope in terms of candidate vaccines um, and, 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 and hope because there are uh, people in organizations that are already developing um, uh, safety communication about the candidate vaccines. Because as we all know around the world, including in our country, there, uh, are, there is various types of movements called anti-vaxxers, people against vaccination. Um, and I think it's very, very important for everyone, even people like me who really loves vaccines and I get every vaccine I possibly can. That, that's approved by the FDA, that is, uh, uh, including many booster shots of all sorts of things. Um, but even for me, it's very important to know uh, how safety for these candidate vaccines against um, COVID-19 is established in humans and animals, and then how is that safety information and efficacy information commuted to, communicated to the public. So in the U.S., first vaccine trial started on, I think it was a Monday, March 16th, um, and now there's other vaccines uh, that have been started in this country in several states. I think in Washington state was the first one, but also in, uh, I think yesterday, there's a new trial, new vaccine, a DNA vaccine started in uh, Pennsylvania, Missouri. I think there was a vaccine last week started in uh, Georgia. Uh, China has multiple vaccine candidates that have, uh, I believe, started already. Uh, and then other nations. And then there's an organization called CEPI, C-E-P-I, or Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. It's an international uh, uh, coalition um, um, with some uh, senior uh, and junior members from, from this country, but from around the world. So there is a, a pretty well-known Dartmouth College alum uh, who on April 5th, um, uh, late at night, uh, I happened to see him on TV and he had this question. And, and what is this question? Why is he asking the question? Because everyone's asking this question now. What is the plan? Uh, for many things, uh, supply chain, respirators, ventilators, uh, therapeutics. Um, but what I'd like to talk about now uh, in my second to last slide is um, what is the plan for what I've termed safely reopening the economy? Uh, I've seen the term used reopening the economy or, 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 or just reopening uh, society. Um, but certainly that's something that China has um, already addressed pretty much everything we have to address. China's already addressed with regard to this pandemic because it started there, you know, several months earlier before it was recognized here. But also, Italy now is talking about uh, how can they reopen their society, their economy. economy. So I've just added the word safely um, 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 be before the phrase reopening the economy. So safely. Um, oops. <clears throat> so. Uh, the term that I've started to use uh, to describe what's going on in the United States now in many parts of the world and will be going on um, in the, what I call the COVID winter coming to the Southern Hemisphere in June, July, August, the phrase is agony to hope. And of course they'll overlap and there'll be varying ratios of the two and now it's more agony than hope uh, in the United States. But as I mentioned, even later this month, there may be um, great reason not only for hope, but for the first time we might have a, at least partially effective treatment. And that will change a lot, along with the uh, uh, antibody test and increasing availability of uh, tests for the virus itself. Um, I made a mistake here, and I apologize. I shouldn't say FDA approved. I misunderstood that. Uh, it's called uh, FDA Emergency Use Authorization, or EUA. It's different than FDA approved, which implies that it's licensed. In other words, there's one company that makes an antibody against this virus. 
um, that the FDA uh, granted emergency use authorization. There are many antibody tests by many companies in different countries, um, but, it's, it, but some of them are not accurate, and that's a huge problem. So one of the things I wrote in the Infectious Society of America webpage is that people who have survived after a few weeks, hopefully they will have made a high levels of an antibody called IgG, and that that will be a market that they are now uh, immune to reinfection and that they're no longer um, contagious. They're no longer uh, shedding the virus or, or, or um, capable of infecting other people. So, and this is not my idea, it's many people's, everyone's had the same, many people have had the same idea. It's not proven that immune survivors are really immune uh, or that having an antibody um, um, of an unknown quantity or titer it means that you are a survivor and that you're immune. But I think that that's the direction that pretty much everyone's going to go uh, on that assumption very slowly. Uh, that, so they may be at the, uh, the vanguard of safely reopening the economy. That is people who have had the disease and have recovered and made an antibody. So again, we should look back at China. Um, and of note, tomorrow, April the 8th, is when the city of Wuhan comes out of lockdown. So most of the rest of China is out of lockdown. And in fact, it was the whole country put in lockdown. I didn't know that until I got to Shanghai. Um, but uh, Wuhan only comes out of lockdown tomorrow after 11 weeks, 76 days since, since January 23rd going into lockdown. Last September, Dartmouth had um, a, a, a wonderful meeting in London. Um, and uh, I was fortunate to be able to, to go to, to speak a little bit about the experience working with patients in West Africa, Ebola. And while I was there, I went to the National Gallery uh, to see a particular painting by Rembrandt. It's called Belshazzar's Feast. It's a biblical story that probably most of you will remember. Um, um, Belshazzar was a Babylonian king. He was having this big feast when suddenly a hand appeared and wrote something on the wall. Um, and he couldn't understand what it wrote, nor could any of his advisors. So they called in someone who could read it, um, and, and, and he translated it. So I'm certainly not drawing any uh, direct uh, analogies here at all. Instead, what I would like to suggest is that we, everyone, all Americans, everyone in the world, all 7.7 .7 billion of us are, are Belshazzar. If we can't read the writing on the wall, which says what we need to do as a species, as a human species, not only as nationalities, because this virus hunts humans, not nationalities. If we can't read the writing on the wall that says maintain physical distance, which I think is more accurate than saying social distance. It's really about physical distance. If we can't do everything that we should do, that now we finally understand around the world we must do to slow down and then stop the transmission of this virus and this pandemic, not only in the Northern hemisphere, but in the Southern hemisphere, then we will suffer the same fate as a species as did the Babylonian King Belshazzar. So on that note, our last slide is this one and it's blank except for the title, the Dartmouth Green. And it's a question. Thank what you very much. Can the global Dartmouth community do to fight this pandemic? So thank you very much. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, I have a long list of questions. Um, the uh, Q and A session has been quite active while you've been talking, so a lot of people have questions. And um, what I like to do is uh, try and get through as many as possible. So if you could try and keep your answers really, really brief, that'd be great, because then we can try and get as many questions answered. Um, let me start with, so how long do we need to continue observing physical distancing and, and what kind of plan do we need to prevent infections from spiking again once those restrictions are lifted? Okay, these would be very succinct answers. Uh, the, in the United States, the models coming out of Seattle that say how long do we have to keep our physical uh, distance really go out to the end of May, not the end of April, but the end of May. I think it'll be partly a political decision by our president uh, as far as uh, how long the country will stay in physical isolation. Um, what do we need to do to prevent a spike? We need to go slowly when we safely reopen the economy. Again, I would argue to lead with people who we think are immune survivors. Excellent. So um, do you know anything about uh, if the severity of disease that someone has is related to, to viral load? So for example, if someone coughs directly in someone's face or if someone just rubs their elbow, and 
And related to that, you know, this difference between the affected in males and females, there's a severity difference between males and females. And, and do you know, can you offer any insight in that? Okay, so again, uh, succinctly, uh, I, I would say that uh, many people, including myself, do suspect that the uh, severity of disease is related to two things. One is the viral load, if you will, or the amount of virus, the virus inoculum, the amount of virus that you're first uh, exposed to. Or for healthcare workers, you are in fact, you're exposed over and over and over, most likely, unless you have adequate personal protective equipment, which was not the case in China early on and not the case in our country and not the case in Iran or, or Italy or, or Spain. Um, but also I think the second thing that's important is the immune system. You know, in your age, uh, if there's any immune compromise, are you on certain medicines that weaken your immune system? So for me, all infectious disease is about the battle between the pathogen and the immune system. So a lot of virus you're exposed to uh, and not such a strong uh, immune system. And in my age, <laughs> mid 60s, high risk of being in the ICU and being on a ventilator. Young, healthy, small amount of virus uh, you're exposed to, likely maybe no symptoms at all or very mild symptoms and hopefully become immune survivor. Uh, as far as men and women, I think it's not proven yet that it's truly a gender or endocrine difference. Um, um, some people said there's uh, co-variables or confounding variables, for example, in China, apparently, uh, many, many uh, more men than women smoke. So there's damage to the lungs from that. But I would say a counter argument is that whether you're a man or a woman, um, you're exposed to uh, air pollution, which can be very, very bad uh, in, in parts of China and parts of India and elsewhere in the world. So, so it's not known. But certainly, I think almost everywhere is reporting that more men than women so far have had uh, the severe, what's called severe or critical stage of the disease. That's yeah. my understanding, but it's not proven yet in the United States, in my view. So along the way, you made a comment about um, Australia and South Africa and, and in Southern Hemisphere moving into winter now and in anticipation of, of an outbreak there. How seasonal do you think this is going to be? Is, is this going to really reflect the, the way the flu comes and goes, or is this going to have a different seasonality to it? So <clears throat> I anticipate that there will be year-round transmission um, uh, in, in the winter in the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere. But because this is the first year of the pandemic and no one in our species has any immunity, then it's going to continue to spread even in our summer, June, July, August in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, uh, and, and it'll go down compared to now, but it will um, uh, not stop. And, and so the, the, the model is not the SARS uh, uh, epidemic of 2003. It's not MERS epidemic that's still going on in the Middle East. Uh, it's not seasonal flu, really. It's a pandemic flu of 2009-10, which did continue even in the winter, June, July, August of 2009, although it went down. Uh, but then there was a, uh, an increase in, in the autumn of 2009. I think that's what we should anticipate uh, and plan for and, and defend against. And, and if someone is, becomes infected and, and recovers, do you expect that to give them long-term immunity or do you think there's a possibility they could be, become reinfected and get sick a second time? Yes, yeah, so I say the key word there is long-term immunity. I do hope and, and anticipate that there will be at least short-term immunity. What does short-term mean? I don't know, but certainly many months, hopefully more than a year, hopefully more than two years. Uh, but I wouldn't count on it being five years or 10 years or, or 15 years like other viruses we've known, like measles or smallpox can give lifelong immunity. I wouldn't count on that. And why I say that is because these four um, coronaviruses that cause just a cold, uh, an upper respiratory infection, not a pneumonia, um, we know that people can be reinfected with those. But I think that this uh, infection, particularly if it involves the lungs, and particularly if you're uh, quite ill, it's going to be a big challenge to the immune system. And if you survive, the immune system is going to have, a, uh, going to have made a very strong immune response. Not only antibodies, which is what we measure because it's much easier to measure than T cells or the, the, the cellular part of the immune system. I think that's probably going to play a very important role as well in conferring immunity. Whether immunity will be strong in people who had no symptoms at all or mild symptoms, we don't know. Science is going to answer that soon. Mm -hmm. um, could, recognizing there may be some non-medical uh, experts on the on the webinar today, um, thinking about this, 
Could you explain how COVID-19 as the disease relates to pneumonia? Are they actually the same or are they different? And do you think a pneumonia 23 vaccine could help people um, in terms of if they contract uh, the, the coronavirus? Hmm. So a good question. Uh, to answer the last part first, um, so I don't forget, uh, the answer is no, um, uh, because that uh, Pneumovax 23, it, it's, it's a vaccine against a bacteria uh, called pneumococcal pneumonia. This is a virus, a brand new virus, so, so quite different. But both this virus and um, in the, in the pneumococcus uh, and many, many other viruses, bacteria, fungi, parasites, maybe prions can cause a pneumonia. Pneumonia just means an infection in the lungs. So um, that, that's what pneumonia means. So this virus often, but not always, causes a pneumonia. Even when you're not particularly sick, if you do a, a radiologic scan of the lungs called a CAT scan or a CT scan, a computerized tomography scan, uh, you can see a, a typical picture caused by this virus in terms of the damage to the lungs or uh, a pneumonia. Some people, though, don't even have the pneumonia. So, um, so that, that's the spectrum of things that you can see. Of course, if it's such a severe pneumonia that you can't get enough oxygen in and expel enough carbon dioxide, then you need to be on a, a, a breathing machine, uh, a ventilator. Um, could you could you talk about a little bit about the ongoing confusion about masks and whether um, everyone should wear a mask or just some people and whether cloth is good or N95, you know, just talk a little bit about masks, their types and, and what they're used for. Sure. So the N95 respirator uh, is really not for the general public. Um, it's only for healthcare workers who are having really direct, you know, face-to-face, -face, um, providing face-to-face -face care. Uh, for, for, for patients. Uh, it's also the N95 that you have to have training. Like I mentioned, the 5,200 people we trained in 2004 at our hospital. Uh, you need to have training on how to wear it properly. There's some people for whom it can cause immediate uh, uh, problems and, and you shouldn't wear it. Uh, so N95 is really not, not necessary, not needed for the general public. Um, and I've never worn it in the general public, only in hospitals. Uh, that said, then there's a so-called surgical mask uh, and, 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 and cloth masks and even bandanas, et cetera. So I'm trying to stay succinct. So basically, I'd say I, I agree with the now. I agree. I didn't agree before, but now I agree with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control uh, recommendation uh, that, uh, that that masks or cloth masks or homemade masks, but not in 95 respirators, should be used by uh, the, the general public. Um, and the argument um, primarily is because now we know there's asymptomatic infection. And you're, you have the infection. You can be expelling the virus into the air. Um, you don't even realize it because you're not sick. So you could be infecting other people without even knowing that you're sick. So wearing a mask physically uh, decreases the likelihood that, uh, that you would infect other people because it serves as a physical barrier. And that, that's really it. So um, one of the things I've heard a lot, I've heard a lot about is different strains of the virus. And so I'm curious if this virus is changing strains from region to region as it progresses. And, and, and along those lines, if we create a vaccine, is that going to be strain specific for some regions and not other regions? So how do we think about the, the rate of change for this virus? And so this is a very important issue. This is an RNA virus, so it mutates uh, frequently. So far, though, fortunately, um, in my opinion, and reading the literature every, every day, uh, uh, it has not significantly mutated to form a different strain. Yes, there are papers out there, there's papers out there and opinions about everything about this uh, uh, virus and this epidemic. Um, but basically, uh, the short answer is no. But could it mutate in a way so that then we need more than uh, one type of uh, COVID-19 or sars cov virus 2 uh, vaccine? Yes, certainly. Um, but it hasn't done so yet. But we shouldn't be surprised if that's what happens. Um, but to me, all the more reason that many different vaccine candidates should be tested immediately as they are. And even companies, if they can be um, willing, I'll just say willing to start producing their candidate vaccines, even before they know it's going to work. Because once it starts, if it is shown to be safe and effective, then we can't afford months, months until they are able to produce very large quantities. So these trials that I've mentioned now, the vaccines, they're so-called phase one. 
it means they're just given like the first one that was started March 16th in America, uh, out, in, out in Washington State. Uh, it, it, to my knowledge, they're only enrolling about 45 people. And then it's going to take three months to know if it's safe and effective. Then you have to go up to more people, et cetera, et cetera. We really need to have large amounts of safe and effective vaccine as soon as possible and certainly before the anticipated second big wave in, in the autumn in the Northern Hemisphere, September, October, November. Yeah. Right now, just one, one vaccine is all we need. That's good. Um, I have th I got two more questions for you, and then we're going to be out of time. So one is, um, are there any special considerations or concerns for pregnant women? So this is a very important question, obviously, and uh, and it continues to evolve. Um, but the short answer is none uh, none that we know of. Although there was one paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association that raised some concerns, had an editorial associated with it. Um, so I guess really my, uh, be, being, a, being a parent myself of two adult sons, uh, I, I'd say that um, we really don't know enough yet. So much uh, larger ongoing studies are, are necessary and they are ongoing now. Um, but it's not like Zika, for example, where we know that there's tremendous uh, in, you know, in utero damage done by, the, by that virus. Uh, but really any, any damage at all is... is, is, is is very, very important to know about. So, so scientists have been looking uh, you know, at, at the, uh, the amniotic fluid. They've been looking at the, uh, you know, by ultrasound uh, during pregnancy. They've been testing the, uh, um, the, the infant, is, is, or the neonate as, as soon as she or he is born, et cetera. So a lot of good science is uh, being done. Um, so really I'd say that nothing that's been unequivocally established in terms of increased risk for women who are pregnant, but we don't know. We don't have enough information and we have to remain hyper vigilant. All right. My last question, we're almost out of time and we still have uh, over 1400 people on here. So I want to ask you um, what, what's going right? What is currently going really well for this both globally and in the, in the United States? Is there, are there things that we're doing well that are making a difference? Yes. So again, to, to end on a, a, hope, a note of hope, uh, we know about the agony. This is about hope. Uh, so I'd say, you, you know, again, always look back to China uh, uh, to see what they've done, and hopefully we'll know accurately what they've done or haven't done. So they are reopening. Their tourist sites are open. You, you know, saw it on TV last week or a few days ago. Uh, and tomorrow, Wuhan is coming out of lockdown um, after, after 11 weeks. So, uh, so that's good news, but I'll be quite amazed and skeptical if in fact there's not other infections going on and transmission in China. Up to now, the past couple of weeks, they said there all the infect almost all the infections have been brought in by foreigners coming in who are infected from other places around the world. So it started in China, it was off the world, now it's coming back into China. Um, so they've instituted quarantine for foreigners and um, um, which, which again is understandable. So see what's happening in China, but they are reopening their economy um, um, apparently safely. Uh, Italy is planning to do the same thing. Um, Iran, I read that they're planning to do that very soon. Um, I really haven't been able to learn much factually about what's been going on in Iran. Um, uh, uh, Spain, the United States, we're, we're still doing what, what we're doing and uh, we still have a long way to go. In terms of hope, I think the thing that I mentioned that there is now um, an FDA uh, emergency use authorization, EUA antibody test, which can be very important, not only in terms of uh, identifying people who uh, are hopefully immune survivors, but identifying how widely the infection occurred in various places across our country, uh, either because people couldn't be tested or because they had no symptoms. So hopefully the virus has um, caused a lot more asymptomatic or very mild infection that didn't require hospitalization. And hopefully those people will be protected uh, at least for the coming months or years. Uh, but we need the antibody test to, to do that. What I saw about two hours ago on uh, uh, Governor Cuomo's, New York Governor Cuomo's uh, daily briefing is that uh, the, in New York, they developed their own antibody test. They're waiting for FDA approval. And then they plan to use it widely in New York State, uh, New York City, obviously, to find people who are, who are um, antibody positive. Uh, and then the virus test itself, the PCR, I won't go into it too much because everyone knows it's been a really, really un unfortunate, um, to use a euphemism, uh, situation. Um, but uh, my understanding is that there's many more, uh, some more tests, including some that um, will diagnose the virus itself by 
recognizing the, identifying the nucleic acid by PCR or other ways within 15 minutes. That's a very important thing to combine those two tests, identify the virus and identify the antibody in other people and putting them together. Hopefully then we'll start to be able to reopen our own economy safely. I should say safely, we use that word first, safely reopen our uh, economy. Um, hopefully the world's gonna come together um, to, uh, um, to mitigate the disease, the epidemic in the Northern hemisphere, but proactively right, right now um, uh, in the autumn in the Southern hemisphere before the winter comes in the Southern hemisphere. So I hope that the World Health Assembly, which uh, meets in May, usually every year in person, all the countries of the world send their health ministers to Geneva. Um, I'm sure that won't happen in person, or I don't think it will this year. Um, but I hope that COVID-19 is at, at the number one uh, issue on the, the agenda for the World Health Assembly in May. And I hope that the United Nations Security Council uh, convenes a meeting for the first time about this COVID-19 pandemic now this month of April. Uh, I've written about that on the IDSA webpage. Uh, the, the UN General, General Assembly, uh, I think unanimously accepted a, a motion uh, recently, but it needs to be taken to the highest level of the UN Security Council. So I hope that happens in, in April. Um, that will be a good thing. Great. I'm, I'm looking at the, the clock and I see we're out of time. So I want to thank you so much for doing this. I, I, I can relate to you that there were lots of great comments. Um, thank you to everyone. Lots of great questions. So your audience was definitely hearing you. And um, there were plenty of uh, accolades coming through your classmates of 1977. So, <laughs> so thank, thank you. you so much for doing this. All right. It's my pleasure, 77. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, Dean Cotton, and to everyone. Thank you so much for giving your time. Bye-bye.